let's move on to out to launch and find out what what's been going on in the launches in the world chris oh yeah absolutely we've got some things to talk about some interesting things what's going on in the out to launch well first of all a lot of what we're, we talk about in a lot of months these days is spacex launches because spacex is launching a lot they're able to reuse uh, their rockets, which means that they don't have to build as many. And this is making a difference. Uh, there are so many SpaceX launches, it's easy to get lost in them. Now, one that I wanna mention right here was a uh, launch on January 31st out of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This was an especially photogenic launch because it occurred right at sunset and it was a very clear sky. So they got some beautiful pictures, not only of the launch, but of the landing. And notice, by the way, the landing on the right of your screen is not on a barge out at sea, it's on land, landing zone one at the Kennedy Space Center. Now, this was carrying a Italian uh, satellite, research satellite into Earth orbit. Um, no big deal as far as that, but I do wanna mention that the mission was delayed a few times. Some were the more traditional reasons that you have with just technical problems, but the delay the day before, which happened at T minus 30 seconds, 30 seconds before launch, they weren't able to go. And the reason for that was somebody got in the way. Um, they actually had a cruise ship get into the area off of the Cape uh, where you're not supposed to fly. The reason they do this is that if the rocket should fail or break apart during the ascent phase, there's a whole zone off the coast where material might fall back down. And it's not just one place, it's a whole stripe of ocean where this could happen because if, it, if the failure happened at a lower altitude, it would fall back sooner. If it happened at a higher altitude, it would take a longer time for the debris to come back down, it would fall farther out to sea. So there's a stripe where you have to keep out of for a safe launch. Um, now, was it was it really the harmony of the seas? That it really the was away? the harmony of the seas. She is a big, big cruise ship, 1,100 feet long, 6,000 passengers, big as a nuclear aircraft carrier. She's a monster. And she started heading right for the zone. And at the last minute, the range safety officer called it and said no, which is very frustrating, of course, to a lot of people. But this isn't a million to one chance. It isn't like the captain was crazy and in an area of the ocean you wouldn't normally be. The map that is shown there shows the shipping lanes that are used by just one cargo company. There are all kinds of ships going around the East Florida coast. It's a choke point. All the cruise ships coming down from New York going to the Caribbean, I've crossed over that same patch of sea about half a dozen times on cruise ships. And then you got the pleasure boaters and all kinds of other people. Now, the reason this hasn't been that big a problem in the past is that they weren't launching as often. It was a rare big deal when the Canaveral Air Force Station would announce they were having a missile test. But SpaceX is launching more and more. They're hoping to get up to using these rockets like airliners. Well, they can't stop all the cargo sh ships and cruise ships at sea every time a plane takes off out of, you know, uh, Miami International Airport. If you're launching many times, this begins to be a problem. So uh, obviously they need to make sure people know when the launches are and get word out to these captains so they'll be out of the area. But we are gonna have to come up with some solutions as we start going to space more often. Fortunately, this wasn't a problem for anybody. No safety issues. Um, another thing that wasn't a serious problem is a parachute thing. It's actually neither of the exact situations you see in those pictures. We actually don't have pictures of what happened on January 24th. It wasn't covered live and pictures haven't been released, but a cargo version of the Dragon spacecraft coming back for the end of mission CRS-24 uh, from the International Space Station was returning cargo off the, the west coast of Southern California. And it came down, the Dragon has four parachutes. That's another landing you see on the left of your screen. And all four parachutes came out as the thing was headed down to splashdown, but one of them, just exactly like you see in this photograph, hesitated. For about a minute, one of the four parachutes wouldn't open. It did end up opening 
on both this mission that you see on your screen there, that has astronauts on board, crew two um, from last year, but also this cargo run, one of them hesitated. Now, fortunately, in both cases, all four ended up coming out. And fortunately, the Dragon only needs three to land safely. The fourth was a backup. So even if that other one hadn't opened, it would have been okay. The picture in color on the other side of your screen is not a dragon. That's an Apollo coming back at the end of Apollo 15 in 1971. And in that case, one of the three parachutes did not open. I mean, really did not open. They hit the water extra hard, but Apollo was designed for two parachutes. The third was a backup, so it was okay. What NASA is doing right now, they are looking at why occasionally one of the four parachutes on the Dragon system is opening a little bit later than the others. It seems to be perfectly okay. And the next crew mission of the Dragon is on track, which will be crew four. Uh, but we do want to look at this. So they're investigating it now. If you hear about it, for now, NASA believes the system is working just fine. The shoots come out, there's just a little bit of a delay on one of the shoots, sometimes, not all the time. Um, we already saw these pictures from David Penske of the launch up at Vandenberg Air Force Base. I want to make the note that if you have a launch in daytime, as this was from California, it, they're not as visually spectacular when the sun's up and the sky is bright blue. To really get a good look of daytime launches, what you need to do is what David did. Go up close and see it. That's how he was able to get these beautiful pictures. If we have a launch that's at twilight after sunset or before sunrise, you can get some really spectacular views where it's dark where you are, but sunshine is shining on the rocket and its plume. So that's just a note about how to observe uh, rocket launches. A little bit of space station news. We're doing a couple of upcoming supply runs to the International Space Station using robotic vehicles. The Russians are sending up a progress and the Americans are sending up the Cygnus rocket. Neither of these launches, of course, from California. But we are continuing to supply the space station. We've talked about the question of how long does the space station go up? We've attached some new modules to the space station. The Russians just did some spacewalks, adding improvements. When will the end of the space station be? Well, it turns out we have some answers. Just recently, we knew the Americans were talking about the, uh, extending to 2028 and then to 2030. We've committed to that, but 2030 is going to be the end of the line for the ISS. The idea is that the ISS will be deorbited in 2031, dropped out of orbit by a robot vehicle like a Progress that has a rocket engine on it. It'll slow it down and it'll fall back to Earth in the area shown by the red area known as Point Nemo, love the name, uh, the area most remote from human habitation. It's where we try to deorbit satellites all the time because the danger to people on the ground is much, much less. There's, it's a safe place to do it. Now, don't think this is the end of space stations, of course. I've already mentioned NASA is talking to private contractors to launch private space stations, and they'll be online before the ISS is retired. No real news down in Boca Chica, Texas, where SpaceX is building their ginormous Starship rocket. Um, they haven't gotten approval from the Federal Aviation Administration to launch from the South Texas site just yet. We're waiting for approval. Uh, however, they are doing all the kinds of testing they need to do. What you're seeing there in the picture looks a little bizarre. Next to their huge launch tower, they have these crane arms that come out that are used not only to hold onto and move the rocket onto its launch pad, but also to catch, yes, I said catch, a descending landing rocket and catch it in these arms like giant chopsticks and then put it back on the launch pad to be reused. They had to make sure the, the launch arms could hold the weight. Those are bags of water simulating the weight of a booster. So they're practicing, making good use of the time. We've been waiting for the space launch system, the giant rocket NASA, not SpaceX, NASA is building for a trip back to the moon. We had hoped that by about a week from now, we would see it roll out. Now you see Apollo 14 there rolling out on the right side of the screen. It's very dramatic when the rocket comes out of the assembly hangar and is actually rolled out into the sunshine for the first time. They've moved it back from this month to next. 
So March is when they're gonna do that. They're gonna roll it out to the launch complex and they're gonna do a fueling test. It'll go back inside the hangar for a few more uh, checks and all the rest of this before they actually wanna launch it to the moon. Uh, now, when, what, it, what is our time frame on launching to the moon? Uh, there are many factors involved with something like the Artemis One mission. Um, we don't know exactly when it will launch. There are windows of time in April and in May. Either of those is a possibility. I'm gonna bet for May. I think May is more likely. Uh, by the way, the launch windows are less constrained than they were for the moon landings in Apollo. The landings had to uh, arrive at the moon when the lighting conditions were exactly right at the landing site. That was one reason that made it a very short period of time when you could launch. We have a little bit more flexibility with Artemis 1. We're not landing, you might remember. We're actually going to be sending the Orion spacecraft to orbit the moon. Nobody on board for this, just an orbital test around the moon. Uh, still be very exciting. Now, you may be wondering, when are we going to put people on this vehicle? Well, that would be for Artemis 2. And NASA has announced that they will be announcing publicly the names of the four astronauts who will fly on Artemis II, possibly in 2024. This will be an orbital mission around the moon, no landing, but they're going to orbit the moon. And uh, there'll be three Americans and there will be one Canadian astronaut, the first Canadian to the moon, by the way. Uh, so pretty exciting stuff. I mean, you know, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to tell your family? Since I was eight years old, this has not happened where anyone could go home and tell their family, I'm going to another world. I'm going to a place where I could cover up the earth with my thumb. It's that far away. And we're just about to get that announcement. Um, this is a picture, you know, the young lady in red there, that's Tracy Cernan watching her father practice for the last moon landing. So hopefully here in the next month, two months, we'll see, we should know the names of the people who got to go home and tell their family they are going to another world. That's a pretty wow. exciting time. With that, I'll toss it back to you, David. Thank you very yeah, that's much. That's a, a super exciting time uh, to be seeing astronauts getting ready to go back on some you know, deep space missions, really. This is the furthest we've been.